Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Wednesday the 17th of November 2021 and I am your host Tom O'Brien. We read Chapter 10, The General Social Work, where we really get into the nuts and bolts of the GIC proposal and leave the critique behind. The output of the show has been a little slack over the last three or four weeks, so apologies for that, but I have six new interview episodes lined up for recording over the next two or three weeks on everything from the blockchain to planning and from Heinrich Grossman to Rosa Luxemburg. So stay tuned. If you like all these extra bonus episodes, creating discord over on the discord server, joining in the Patreon reading groups, why not head on over to the Patreon and throw us a few commie dollar. It really does help keep the episodes flowing. Okay, let's join the discussion. Welcome to the 10th session of our reading group series on the fundamental principles of communist production and distribution by the group of international communists. Today we are on to chapter 10. This is where we're starting to get deep into the bowels of essentially, I don't I don't go as far as call it a proposal. I kind of go say more like it is a kind of an unraveling of Marx's concepts in in his writings in the critique of the Gotha program on capital and putting some kind of what would I say, putting some flesh, some kind of formulas around the concepts that are described there. But even though the concepts and the formula, even though the formulas here are very, very simple, I don't know, there's something about them when you see them written down that really is a bit of a kind of a mind blower to me. I don't know if anybody else had this experience when reading this, but this chapter I found really, really brilliant the first time I read. So Let's start in here from the general social work part A, two forms of distribution. Who do, do we have anybody here who wants to go first? Who's brave enough to take the first section? Slavic. The general social work, two forms of distribution. In the previous chapters, we have already dealt with the general basis of distribution. As long as goods are still in the production cycle, they are therefore passed on, distributed, based on the socially average production time. When they leave this cycle to move on to individual consumption, distribution takes place on the same basis, with working time being the measure of individual consumption. A single economic law, therefore, regulates the entire operational life, both production and consumption. The same economic law regulates each part of the operational life as well as the whole. Or, as we can also say, the one general law which governs the whole operational life is expressed in every single manifestation of the social metabolic process. Now, however, we must draw attention to a group of operations which seem to be violating this general law. First and foremost, we are talking about those operations which do not fall within the scope of production but which are nevertheless indispensable to social life. These include, for example, all types of economic and political councils, the economic organizations for general social accounting, health care, education, the creation and maintenance of parks, all types of cultural and social institutions, and so on. The special feature of these operational units is that they do not produce a product, but provide a service to society. All these economic organizations consume means of production, raw materials, and food for the workers concerned. Still, for some, it is impossible and for others undesirable to pass on this service to consumer in exchange for work certificates. The nature of these operational units means that they put their product, their service, into consumption without economic measure. In this way, they work free of charge for the consumers, while at the same time the product is taken according to the needs. So, we have a group of operational units whose product does not consider working time as a measure of consumption. Concerning the distribution of consumer goods, we therefore distinguish between two types of operational units. The first type, which 
puts its product into consumption in exchange for work certificates, we call the productive operational units. The other, which we work free of charge, which work according to the principle of taking as needed, are called public operational units or general social work units, abbreviated as GSW units. Okay. This is the, the, the core distinction. Let's go back to this first sentence, which, or this sentence here, which I think is very nicely put. The one general law which governs the whole operational life is expressed in every single manifestation of the social metabolic process. Okay, so that's a really nice way of putting the idea that the production and the consumption is linked through this simple one law of a labor time measure and it governs every aspect of the social metabolic process similar to how the value form in capital expresses the social metabolic process anybody have anything to say on this this bit here we're going to make this distinction here between he's building up this kind of distinction between productive and non-productive work so in essence you have a, a lump of work that is productive it's easiest to think of these about the actual products you know a shoe, a washing machine, a machine, <clears throat> or whatever. You have you have stuff that is products, and then on the other side, you have services. Okay, now, it's not strictly like that. You could imagine a, a massage as being one that you have to pay for. That's a service. But if you want to think about it, a kind of an easy dichotomy for thinking about it is like products, and on the other side are services, services that are free at the point of consumption. Uh, you don't have to pay anything when you drop your child to school. Maybe the swimming pool is free. You don't have to pay when you go in. All of these are consumption based on need and not on your actual paying an amount. And we're going to split these up. So we've got, we have this dichotomy between productive operational units, ones that sell their actual output, and then we have the general social work units, the GSWs, who basically use raw materials fixed and circulating inputs and they have their labor inputs and the inputs that they are going to use have to come from the productive sector and that's going to be the kind of basis of the whole thing we're going to see the productive sector essentially subsidizes the general social work units anybody have any problems with this kind of dichotomy uh, okay kill I just find the word productive really confusing, but that's possibly just me. You know, I'm used to I'm be, used to being told all the time that something that's useful is productive, and that we're always measuring productivity. But here, the language is more like it. It doesn't really matter. It just means you're. It's not even that you're producing a product, because as you said, you might charge for some services as well. So I find the whole the whole sort of the way this language is is is, is laid out a little bit confusing. But I mean, that's possibly because it was produced. It was written so long ago. Because in, in, in general, they're both really useful sectors. And yeah, so the distinction isn't, isn't the difference between one that's useful and not useful in, in, in that way. And I don't feel like it's even right to talk about one as cross-subsidizing the other because you can't work if you don't have the childcare or the medical care that are free services in, in, in such a society. Uh, yeah, I think it comes, I think it comes Kilcher, out of Marx's distinction for productive and non-productive labor, that it, it's kind of following Marx's logic like it, it sounds like you're making a normative statement about the actual labor, but for Marx, I think it's got a technical meaning when he talks about productive and non-productive labor. It's not something I'm particularly hot on. I, I mean, I need to read about it. I'm not exactly clear on exactly precisely Marx's definition, so I don't want to claim that I do, but I think that's where they're coming from. Okay, let's move it on. The GSW budget. It goes without saying that this difference in distribution brings with it complications in social operational life. Services, such as healthcare, education, etc., consume all kinds of social goods, but they do not add a new product to the social stocks. The consequence is that the workers in productive operational units cannot consume the proceeds of their labor on their own. They must also support the workers of the public enterprises. Yes, they must also produce the means of production and raw materials for these services. This is the particular challenge. 
For example, if the workers have worked 40 hours a week in their operational unit, they could not get 40 hours of pay because then nothing would be available for the public service. So they have to give a part of the proceeds of their work to these services. The question is, however, which part? How much work must they give to public services? Fortunately, this last question can now be answered very quickly. Public services are invoiced in the same way as productive operational units. They also calculate their consumption of means of production, raw materials, and living labor so that society knows exactly how much labor is consumed by education, healthcare, and so on. So basically, the same thing happens as under capitalism. The different branches of GSW operations each draw up a budget of how much work they want to spend on the different forms of F, C, and L in the current year. It is the amount of work that the society wants to make available to the public operational units for the current year. To give this budget a clear representation, we use the same production formula as for producing operations. However, we put the index P at the foot of the letters to indicate that these are public operational units. The production formula for each operational unit is thus FP plus CP plus LP. If we add up the expenditure of all public operational units, we have an overview of the total consumption of all public operational units, which we can simply express with the following formula. Capital FP plus capital CP plus capital LP. If we replace the letters with fictitious numbers, the general budget for public services could look like this. 8 million plus 50 million plus 50 million equals 108 million working hours. The question now is how these social costs will be borne. Okay, so we've seen these, the formula before for our productive units, which is, you know, our fixed, our circulating inputs and then our labor inputs okay and now we have exactly the same formula it's super simple so the three three entries but we're just putting a little p on the bottom to denote that public units so these are our general social use factories or whatever and we can just sum them all up all the ones that are of a certain sector all the hospitals all the schools and then we have we denote these with capitals fp plus cp plus lp and this would be our total overall public services in the economy or in the society. So he's given an example here of like 8 million fixed capital for the public, for the hospitals and all that, 50 million for the circulating, you know, the books, the linen, the whatever the hell is needed in all the hospitals, 50 million for the workers, and it's 108 million working hours. So of all the hours in the entire economy, now we have a, a lump and we can literally say, all right, you know, in the entire economy, 108 is going towards these shares based on, you know, consumption based on need and not being able to purchase it. And that's all it is. So we, 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 we use the exact same foundational, simple formulas that we looked at the operational units. And now we're just applying the exact same logic here towards these general social work units. OK, does anybody have any questions on that formula? It's pretty simple. Maybe we can keep going. Uh, does somebody else want to put up their hand and take the next one? Simon. Okay. The usual solution under capitalism is that the state provides itself with the necessary resources by levying all kinds of direct and indirect taxes, i.e. deprives the consumer of the right to a part of its consumer goods. Russia solves the problem by allowing most of the profits of state enterprises to flow into the state treasury and by levying indirect taxes. For example, by reintroducing vodka Russia has acquired the necessary resources, as this has brought several million into the coffers. Soviet Hungary used the same methods. It obtained the necessary resources through its price policy, i.e. from the monopoly profits of the operational units and the surplus value of the labour power. This is the practical solution. However, the theory knows two more solutions. First, the solution for the general cartel of uh, Hilferding. In this fantastic fantasy, the subject poses no problem at all. The central control of production determines where the means of production and raw materials should go, 
and at the same time allocates to the consumers how much is available for individual consumption. It is true, this theory is rather poor, but we cannot change that. The second solution is that of calculating the social cost of production, the so-called principal solution of Varga. He wants to include the social costs in the price of the products. But this cannot be called price policy because he wants every social product to be increased by a fixed percentage. Therefore, no policy regarding prices can be possible. Unfortunately, Varga does not elaborate on his principal solution, so he must be sat satisfied with this feeble reference. However, this theory can easily be followed up with Leuchter. We immediately have the advantage that this leads us to an author who knows exactly how to grasp the problem. Later, however, we will see that Leuchter gives up his exact solution and again takes pleasure in the price policy. Finally, we should mention Marx's solution in the critique of the Gotha program, which does not deal with pricing policy, which does not include social costs in product prices, but gives workers fewer assignments on the social products if we summarise both the theoretical and practical solutions, there is a general consensus that costs should be added to the price of the products, except for Marx. In theory, however, this method is very questionable, as it never gives us a good overview of how much work each product requires to make it. It therefore hinders a proper insight into the rationality of the different operating procedures. Besides, the percentage of prices has to be fixed every year, which leads to problematic price fluctuations. Moreover, the theorists who want to increase the price of all products will not do so, but will resort to the usual price policy. Therefore, according to the current state of research on the communist economy, there can be no exact relationship from producer to product. What consumers get out of it always remains an uncertainty. We have to wait and see what is allocated to us. However, we cannot pay enough attention to the fact that this problem is one of the most important issues of communism. That is why, in the face of all the fantasies about the future that are presented to them from different sides, workers must always ask themselves the question, how is the problem of social cost to be solved? Because this is one of the most important roots of state communism. This is one of the most important roots of the domination of the working class. The privileged classes will retreat to the fortress of price policy as the last position to maintain their privileges. Okay. Okay, so there's quite a good bit of stuff there. So he says here that, like most of the other, all of all of the other kind of communist people theories, whether they say it or whether it's what they fall into in practice, is about a price policy by fixing an additional element to the product. So why is this a bad thing? Because then you break the link between the amount of labor in the product and the price of the product. Like for Marx and the critique of the Goddard program, and what we're all following here is that there is a labor price. You know, there is the socially necessary labor time or whatever we would average social production time price on a product. And if you start doing price policies whereby you increase the price on those things. So this shoe here, instead of having two labor hours on it, has 2.79 labor hours price on it. And that does not represent the, the labor that's in there. It acts to kind of obscure the relations that are going on. That's one one point here. So what Marx does is he actually, he doesn't change the price on the products, but he changes the amount of private consumption that the individual will get. Okay, so this is quite an important distinction because if we say here, let's read this bit here. In theory, however, this method is, uh, this is talking about a price policy, is very questionable as it never gives us a good overview of how much work each product requires to make it. It therefore hinders a proper sight into the rationality of the different operating procedures. And finally, then, like, if, if there is a price policy, like, workers always have to kind of wonder what's going on with this price policy. How is the problem of the social cost to be solved? Who is going to be doing that? How am I going to do in this? You know, like workers get jobbed every day by capitalism. They don't, they don't want to get jobbed in communism too. They want it to, to be rational, clear, and straightforward them to understand what's going on. Anybody have any thoughts on this distinction between a price policy and the labor time price? Simon? Yeah, I think um, it put me in mind of a much earlier passage uh, where they were talking about how 
in uh, capitalism, more surplus is always taken as a as a good in itself, and that the advantage of this labour hours accounting is that because it's completely transparent, how much how much work is required for how much product, we can see the trade off that we're making for hours worked for benefits received. And that's the problem with the wage form is that the wage form doesn't have that transparent relation. So you can't see why you necessarily have to work X amount of hours. And I think that something similar has been pointed to here, that if you if you pay for public services from taxation or by a price policy like this, then you've broken that transparent link and then you have people working simply on the basis of Big tax from on high. Yeah, I think it's amazingly clear. Kilter. I just don't get this section at all. So uh, as I see it, what we're saying here is a distinction between essentially the equivalent in a capitalist economy would be an income tax or a sales tax. And it's saying that some are saying do one or some are saying do the other. Where in capitalism, we do both. And I, I don't actually see a, a problem with doing that here as well. It's it, it, You could... You could put a tax on 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 the price of all all the products, and you could also tax people at the point where they where they where they're earning. And it's just two different ways of of, of raising labor hours that can then be used in in, in non productive parts of the, the the economy. It's it, it doesn't quite make sense to me why why it's a particularly important facet of having this labor value based economy. It just feels like some lever that you have to pull in that type of economy, just as you do in a capitalist economy. Well, what I would say to you there is like, say, for example, right, like I want to buy a new bike, right? And if we have a timed in labor hours, okay, it, it will have like four and a half labor hours price in the bike, say, or 29 labor hours. I know exactly what the relation between my work and that bike is, what I have to do to get that bike, okay? Now, if there is a price policy, okay, which is very unlikely to be a universal price policy, because why the hell would you do that? That that price, that bike might go from 29 labor hours, and it might be then priced up to 37.3 labor hours, okay? But another one mightn't be priced up as much because somebody somewhere is making a decision on a price policy. So the prices that are on the actual goods is not the actual labor time that's in it. It's something different. So you're changing the relation between the worker and his product. I what, think what, that's what they're trying to get at. Why wouldn't it be universal? You could, because all the sales taxes are universal. A VAT is, is a... No, they're you know, not. You, you've, got, you've got different things for different categories, but it's, yeah. it's, it's relatively limited in, 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 most, in most places. So no, most there's massive just, differences. Like alcohol is, Yeah, but I mean, that's... Alco- that's alcohol, a, kids' clothes. There, there's loads of different variations all over the place. And like, who gets to decide on that policy? And how Which transparent is, just like, is it? Everything else that, that we've got in this in, in this society, you've got you've got political you know, ways of deciding all, all of these things, and, and that's kind of orthogonal to the. This is this is a system of accounting for, for for running an economy, but there are still going to be political decisions about how things are paid for and and, and how much money is is you know, labor value to decide for different things. So you could just as easily tax things at the, at the point of people working or um, at, at, at the price, and people will still understand just as they do when they're buying something in a shop. That if you're adding on twenty percent, that you know the amount of hours worked is 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 eighty percent of what you're paying for. I, I, I I'm not I'm not just not I, I, I hate you saying I'm just I'm not saying it. Like, I'm not saying that you technically can't do it. That's not kind of not the point. The point is that you break that rational link. Like so, what you actually do is you obscure again the difference between labor and your your consumption. But if you tax people when they work, you're still obscuring it because you're saying that you work ten hours and we're going to take one of those hours and that's going to pay for services. So you're just obscuring it in a different way. Whatever way you do it, it's going to obscure it. That's well, that's well, you're, you're not obscuring. You're not obscuring because you're not saying you're not changing the amount of labor they need to get to get that thing. They know what they have to to do to get it. It's, they're not saying that. So this will this essentially is not somebody twisting knobs on different price stuff and trying to control society in a certain way. Like it's trying to get away from that ability for people to uh, have price policies. It's the thing that we've spent probably eight chapters shitting on is a price policy. And like, we're not saying it's not possible to do a price policy. We were saying that it, it kind of goes against the rationality, the open, clear rationality of the system and breaks the link 
I think to, I think it fundamentally breaks the link in a stronger way than taking away the amount of consumption you have but keeping the labor price. There's a few people want to get in, Kielce. I'm not trying to cut you off. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. Chris, I think first. Yeah, no, I, I just think, wouldn't this make sense if taxes are presented not as some, you know, like as just you think a certain labor hours are ear, earmarked such that the proceeds of it go to a specific work. Like, you know, you you work one hour a week or two hours a week in order to support general social work, something like that, no? Like it's sort of, you know, like pioneers in North America had bees. You know, you had a barn raising bee, a forest clearing. Like there, there was just certain times of the year, almost like a like a voluntary corvée, right? Where everyone just pitches in to do something that's useful for everyone. Like I, if everything is uh, reducible to labor time, I, I just think, you know, well, taxation, just make it earmarked labor time on a weekly, monthly or whatever basis. So you want to return to feudalism. That's your problem, Chris. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there you go. But it, but you know what I'm saying, right? I do. I'm joking. I'm only doing yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I, I think that's totally transparent like and uh, comprehensible. It's actually like, you know, Marx, when he's critiquing, like the, when he's talking about like feudalism in chapter, I think in the early chapters of Capital, and he talks about how it, the transparency of the social relations was an important thing in feudalism. And I think we should be looking for that transparency in the in the relations here. I think Slavic was next, and then Simon. Yeah, so a uh, two-parter here. So obviously, you know, if you just raise the price of, say, bread, and you can't really distinguish between, well, how much is it just being inflated, and then yeah, obviously it's obscuring. But I'm wondering, like, how does like if it if it says hey we're inflating this piece of bread by one labor hour, would would that basically make it like just obscure it less? And then and the second part of that is, in the case of luxury goods, wouldn't you want to in some cases like okay if people are saving up their money for luxury goods, wouldn't we want to price policy that in order to kind of yeah, if you're getting like a luxury good versus bread, then that means like, okay, you're going to be generating more for the general social work. Wouldn't there be an advantage to that? Uh, like the thing is like, it's not like we care about luxury versus bread in any real sense because we don't have differential wages and we're not trying to, we're not playing class war with the pricing policy. We have Wages are non-exploitation and everybody's getting the same wage for our work. So the fact that like some people want to have luxury consumption versus consumption of other stuff, I, I don't know if that's very much of an issue. Like I, I think there is a case to be made perhaps for certain rents perhaps to increase the price. I, I would think it would need to be highly, highly selective. Like one example, I think Herman was saying to me, like if you had two fields in two different valleys in France and the same amount of labor goes into making the, the bottle of wine, but one wine comes from like a better soil valley than another and it will attract a, a better price that if you sell both them on the market, you will probably end up with a black market occurring with respect to the better wine and people trying to buy it and then selling it on at a higher price. So I think there are certain places where there are rents that you would like to extract that you could use then to reduce the overall amount of tax that the people would have to pay. I think in a very limited situations, you could do that. But I think when you get to the, if you get to this stage of just literally having a price policy that is completely, will, will end up becoming completely out of whack with actual labor time. I think you end up very much getting away from the rationality and the transparency of the system. That's that's the way I think about it. Perhaps in very narrow cases, much like we talked about maybe perhaps post in the revolution of having some type of maybe differential wage for a short period until we skill people up. I think that there is, in certain cases, there would be an argument to be made. But as, a, as an overall thing, I would not go with a price policy. I think it sounds like to go against the whole transparency of the system. I think we had Simon then? Yeah, I uh, 
just want to return to Chris's point there, the kind of barn raising model. And uh, that just put me in mind of Michael Albert's Paracon model. And I was thinking that might be one way of approaching this GSW thing would be via Albert's job complexes that maybe, uh, you know, we can make it a portion of everybody's working time that they do some uh, healthcare work or educational work or uh, whatever else, or, you know, park maintenance or something like that. And just integrate that into everybody's, you know, work program. Like that's definitely, you know, something that could be done. I think probably just the you'd have difficulties with the division of labor there. But like there's no logical reason why that couldn't be done to be. Um, Chris says we could mix all the wine in a general social vat. Spoken like a, a true <laughs> sommelier. I know that. I like that one, Chris. Anybody else want to get on this? But I do like your idea, uh, Simon, there. I do like the idea of that, you know. I think that probably that could be operationally very difficult, though. I think it's probably easier to mix up the job complexes within your own area of work. Like, if you're a doctor in a hospital, maybe you do some other rote work within the hospital. I can imagine that that would be more likely to be what would evolve. But perhaps not. Maybe, maybe you could have a combination well, I'd be, thinking, I'd be thinking along those lines in the sense that, say, in a hospital, you'd have teaching roles as well as cleaning roles or whatever. But, uh, you know, you, if you were working in a hospital, you could, you know, so, spend some time doing surgery and then some time teaching surgery and then other times, you know, maintaining the, the gardens in the hospital, you know. Anybody else? Or we keep going? Yeah, if you want me to carry on, I'll do that. So, uh the first one to bring forward the solution to this problem is Otto Leuchter because he was the first to put the communist economy on the exact ground of working time calculation. The first source of income for the social costs lies in the profits, quote unquote, companies. This is actually a strange thing with Leuchter. Although it is, quote, most obvious for him, unquote, to lead the product flow along the path of the social working time spent on it, he does not implement this. Although he groups similar companies to form a guild, he does not use this to resolve the contradiction between the different operational averages and the social average. The production time of the worst, i.e. the most expensive enterprise, is considered to be the price of the product. So the better equipped operational units can make an additional profit as under capitalism. Of these profitable operational units, he says, they will then make a differential rent, or capitalistically speaking, a surplus profit, which of course cannot be given to this factory alone, but again, capitalistically speaking, must be taxed away. Of course, these revenues are not sufficient, and for likes are also not decisive. When he continues to study the subject, he will try to grasp it more precisely, which is a significant advance over everything we have in this field. Firstly, he wants to add up all general expenses, as we did in our fictitious GSW budget. Then he also wants to determine how many working hours per year are worked together by all the workers. It goes without saying that general social accounting is necessary for this. By comparing these two figures, Leuchter believes he has found a figure that indicates how much work and time each worker must give to society per hour to cover all social costs. He then creates this deduction by increasing the production time of the products according to the number of hours spent on them. Before we explain this in more detail, we will first explain literally what he said about this. Each production plant will therefore have to reckon with a rate for general administrative costs of the entire factory to be determined annually when the overall balance sheet, or in socialist terms, the business plan, is drawn up. The total sum of the administrative costs, which thus weigh on the entire production, will be related to some variable probably best of all to the total number of hours worked in production and distribution, and the resulting ratio will be added to the wage total spent when calculating the production costs, so that the cost price of the commodity also includes the cost of society. Because numbers always speak louder than words, or speak better than words, we want to express Leuchter's intention in fictitious numbers. Leuchter asked a question like this. The GSW budget is 108 million working hours. The total number of hours worked by all workers should be 650 million. Per hour in capita, this results in a social expenditure of 108 to 650, 
equals 0 0.166 hours. Now, the social expenditure must be included in the price of goods. For this purpose, we take our example again from the shoe factory. The price by Leuchter now looks as follows. F plus C plus L plus GSW equals price. 1250 plus 61,250 plus 62,500 by 1,166 equals 135,375. This is an average of 3.384 hours per pair. The production costs are now higher than in our calculation, which goes without saying. The additional income must now be paid by all operational units to the general treasury, which means that all costs are actually covered. We have not made this further explanation of the Leuchter's principle because we agree with it. On the contrary, the wording is wrong. This is shown by the fact that this method of calculation would generate even more than the social cost. However, we do not want to eliminate this uncleanliness because we reject the whole principle. The error is because Leuchter has no clear idea of what is actually happening. This is evident from the fact that he says the social costs are probably best put in relation to work. The reality, however, is that there is no other way. Okay. Oh, what to say about all this rubbish? Okay, let's have a <laughs> let's have a look here. So he has this idea, this concept of how to put a price on a on a product. So let's have a look here. So the production time of the worst, the most expensive enterprise is considered to be the price of the product. So if you've got like three shoemakers, the shittiest shoemaker, the least productive, that's going to be the labor hours involved in their shoe is the price. So when the other two sell their shoes at that price, they'll make a, a profit. So that profit essentially goes into the central tax revenue for the, for the government, and then they spend that in the GSU. Okay, so that's a very different way of doing it. It's actually keeping a kind of a surplus form, which is kind of not where you kind of want to go. We want to get away from this idea of surplus. Anybody, a Carson? Uh, so my question is with the last paragraph. What are they saying about Leichter specifically? Do they agree? It seems like they start off with, they fundamentally agree with some aspect of it. But at the end of the um, paragraph, it seems like they're deviating more and more from it. Yeah, like I think they're saying that he has the right idea by doing labor time planning in like the F plus C plus L equation, but that he kind of gets mixed up in the math and he takes the incorrect approach by basically implementing a price policy as opposed to a deduction from the amount of consumption of the person. So instead of taking from the person directly they're they're trying to add on labor hours to the objects and those breaking that rational link but also his calculations is wrong his calculation actually doesn't actually work if you try and work out the equivalent between how how it's calculated by the gic guys and the formulas we're going to come on to soon and you look at the equivalent formulas here you'll see that his math is actually incorrect as well on top of the actual wrong approach according to the gic Anybody want to put the hand up to read the next section? Chris. However, Leicester's considerations, as mentioned above, are nothing more than a theoretical gimmick for him. He does not take it so seriously. And for all those who don't understand it, it's no problem at all. Because Leicester doesn't apply it in practice anyway. In practice, he doesn't mind his ratio at all. Yes, he doesn't even look at them. It is even a mystery why he wants it to be calculated. This ratio only makes sense if all products are priced according to this measure. And how does Leicester apply it? Well, as follows. It would, of course, be an injustice and would, would have almost the effect of an indirect tax if one wanted to add the same general expense rate to all goods, the most primitive as well as the most luxurious the simplest as well as the most complicated, the most absolutely necessary as well as the most superfluous. It will be one of the most important tasks of the economic parliament or the supreme economic management to set the general rate of expenses for each industry or product, but always in such a way that the entire expenses of society are brought in. In this way, it will 
also be possible to influence the pricing policy from central points of view. To our regret, we have to note here that in Leicester's case, the speech obviously serves to hide the thought. To avoid the accusation of indirect taxation, he does not want all members of society to bear the costs of education, health, etc., equally, but apparently it wants to draw on those with a higher income than those who have been made happy by nutritional physiologists. However, we have to say that for us, this indeed has the character of indirect taxation. We are talking here about the expenses of the general social institutions. Why should the rich contribute more here than the physiologically and scientifically nourished? Is this perhaps Leicester's bad conscience for its antagonistic distribution of the social product? By the way, we believe with Leicester that it will indeed be one of the most important tasks of the economic parliament to determine which products and how much indirect taxes will be levied. Of course, this is a struggle about the distribution of the national income and how this distribution will finally come about will be decided by the balance of power in Leicester's class society. It will depend on how much power the working class can develop against the supreme leadership. What do you make of that then, Chris? Uh, so he's bringing up, I guess, for the first time, the economic parliament, right? Does he distinguish this anywhere? Because I know he mentions later on, like the general, you know, Congress of, of councils. Is, is this the same well, kind of a body or? Uh... I think he's kind of slagging Leiter because I think maybe Leiter <laughs> is more of a kind of a SPD yeah. type. Okay. Who, who sees like a parliamentary form. Oh, right, right, right. And okay. so like. You know, he has economic parliament, so the like a parliamentary democracy form whereby, like, you know, they will decide how much the taxes are levied, and they also have differential wages. So, oh. like, which gets taxed and which doesn't then becomes like a balance of power in the like class society. I think that's his point. Oh, yeah, obviously. Sorry, I should have uh, picked up on the uh, sarcasm. I think Emil wanted to get in. Emil. Yeah, so I've been parsing this question about why don't we just uh, have a socialist VAT instead of uh, taking it at the, the, the income side. And the, the crux of the matter here is at the is right here at the end. Eh? This is a struggle about the distribution of the national income and how this distribution will finally come about, will be decided by the balance of power in Leicester's class society. So I, I get that. So basically what he's saying is we need some kind of permanent state apparatus, some kind of bureaucracy and some kind of bureaucratic or parliamentarian decision making mechanism to decide huh, how much tax is levied, what kind of products are, are, are actually taxed on and which are exempt from taxes, etc. And basically, the, the simplest solution would then be to have this deduction at the, the income side. So possibly that that's, that's the solution to that question, I suppose. But then again, to have a deduction, you probably at least at, at, its, at the start yeah, uh, of, of this kind of society, uh, you would also need some kind of state apparatus to, to enforce that, I suppose. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure yet if that is a actual solution to this uh, kind of question, really. I'm, I'm still a bit puzzled. Like, uh, I think that these are guys are, these are council communists. So they're making the claim that, you know, we're getting rid of the state. It's all going to be a series of councils that will be making that higher, what would you, what would you call a federated system of councils, I presume, that would, and uh, that the decision making would, would push upwards I don't think they're 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 talking about uh, like taking over the state and having a parliament. I think they're, you know, they're going directly against that. You know, in a revolutionary period, what would you know smashing the state look like? It's kind of it's hard to know what explicitly they're saying about it in the revolutionary or post-revolutionary bit, but that's the general gist of it. I think. Okay, will we try the next bit then? So we're now getting onto the, the, these formulas of Marx. Uh, of Marx, well, these formulas trying to put into trying to put into math what they interpret Marx to have said. Okay, the Marxist solution. Hands up, who wants to do a bit of reading here? Alan. All right, F. The Marxist solution. 
When we speak of the Marxist solution to the problem, we do not at all mean that Marx gave it to us. Whether or not he has spoken on this subject has nothing to do with it. To make this clear, it should be pointed out at this point that we did not know Marx's most important document on this subject, the critique of the Gotha program, when we were researching the problems of the communist economy. To solve the problem of social costs, we had to be guided by the Marxist way of thinking, which confronted us directly with all communist economists. It was only later, after our research was completed, that we got our hands on critique of the Gotha program, and it turned out that our views were completely in line with those of Marx. In studying the movement of communist economic life, we must be aware that each form of society has its own economic laws of movement. We found that the socially average production time to be the central category that regulates and orders both the economy as a whole and each part separately. This law of movement also contains a solution to the problem of social costs. It is certainly conceivable that the cost can be found by the detour of price increases, but then the law of average production time is broken, which leads to all kinds of entanglements in the international movement of goods, and also, as we will see later, hinders the growth of communism. The regulating function of the average production time must be maintained completely so that the social costs can only be achieved by a direct deduction of consumer money. This is the basic solution. Whether this deduction is made directly in the operational unit or is accounted for in some other way is irrelevant. Okay. Kilcha in the comments says this section is uh, smug much. Yeah, so they're kind of saying, you know, we never read the Critique of Program and look, we came up with this all by ourselves. I, I do think it's possible to do that from the other parts of where Marx has stuff in capital to come up with the same basic solution. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's impossible, but I think it's there might be some blowing of their own trumpet there, uh, I think. So let, let's have a look here. So this is to your point, Kielce. He says it, it, it's certainly conceivable that the cost can be found by the detour of price increases. So it, it's, it's technical possibility. But then the law of average production time is broken, which leads to all kind of entanglements in the international movement of goods. And also, as we'll see later, hinders the growth of communism. So uh, honest to God, I have no idea what that sentence he's talking about here for international movements of goods uh, okay i suppose maybe for, yeah I, I can see what they're saying here is that if you had say two separate communist societies bordering each other and they were going to do international trade that if they were priced in labor time exactly that you could do a change of exchange of equivalents very easily but when you have different price mechanisms obfuscating it so exchanging like wood from a finnish area communism to a russian area communism or something that if they had different tax rates on all this stuff it would hinder uh, or lead to what would we say it wouldn't be as smooth as if everything was on their labor time price and hinders the growth of communism well we'll have to see what what he's talking about there because i don't know what he's talking about there yet the regulating function of the average production time must be maintained completely so the social cost can only achieve by a direct deduction of consumer money. This is the basic solution. Okay. Whether this deduction is made directly in the operational unit or is accounted for in some other way is irrelevant. So he's saying it doesn't matter like if it's in the operational unit, it's taken away from your wages there or maybe it's taken away later on in some other process. The point is that the price, the labor time price on the product should be kept and not a price policy. That's that's what they're saying. Any comments on this? Kielce? I was just thinking about the sort of duality between whether you whether you tax people on income or, or, or price of the product. And there's there's still some challenges because if you if 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 you're in if you're in England and you're taxed on your work, but you, they're, they're taxed at a higher amount in France, but you go to France and then you use their medical, their much better medical system then you're still gaming the system. So there's always going to be these ways to, to play off different localities against each other, which was the primary argument they made there for not, well, one of the arguments made there for, for not using the price, uh, different prices in different places. But uh, yeah, I, like, I, so, I get the other know, reasons. I, yeah, like I can get, even even the reason like you're saying, like say France had a communist society and England had a communist society. Yeah. Like you could have like literally agreements of like, you know, they can actually cost up what it costs to, to do for you in labor time hours. And like you literally have to pay your British labor time hours into like a French fund because you haven't worked in France first. And on the other side, 
you know, the French will be paying for it. And they might have an agreement whereby they allow, you know, like the EU does, you can get your treatment in different countries if you're there, if you're a, an EU citizen or whatever. So like, I think there's all manner of ways that could be handled. How these ways not capitulate regional boundaries in ways that recapitulate states, which is exactly the thing we're trying to avoid doing. Yeah, like uh, I'm totally not putting forward a case for a difference. <laughs> I'm just saying like you could imagine, say, a communist bloc in Europe trading mm-hmm. with a communist bloc, say, in South America that are not contiguous, say, and that happened integrated with each other. You know, I could imagine that being a thing. I'm just, that's, I think, what they're trying to say. Non-contiguous, uh, stateless communism. That's kind of that's kind of what we want. <laughs> but like, maybe maybe that maybe we won't get there initially. I don't know. I presume that's kind of the point we're trying to make. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Alan, do you want to keep going there on the payout factor? All right. Gee, the payout factor. After this principal solution, we can move on to a more concrete consideration. To do this, we must closely follow what actually happens in the distribution of the social product. This is then the following. Let us imagine, for example, that all goods produced in one year are brought together in one large warehouse. From this social stock, the so-called productive companies first take their used means of production and raw materials to be able to start a new production period. Then the public companies take as many means of production and raw materials as their budget allows, The rest is consumed by all workers together. This is the essence of what actually happens. But of course, the way the distribution takes place is not like that. In reality, it does not take place after a year, but at every minute of the day. Nor should it be forgotten that the main characteristic of productive operational units is that they do not work for free and therefore reproduce themselves. However, they do not have to supply an actual product at all. For example, transport companies, as long as they are not public operational units. All these side effects obscure the essential flow of things. For the time being, we will leave these veils as they are, and we will use figures to illustrate once again the essential process as formulated above. To this end, we assume that the budget for the productive operational units is as follows. F plus P plus L equals product mass. 100 million plus 600 million plus 600 million equals 1300 million working hours. From this product mass of 1300 million working hours, these operational units first renew their means of production and raw materials, leaving behind a product mass which embodies 600 million working hours. The requirements of public operational units must be covered from this remainder. This makes it clear that the social costs can be borne solely by living labor power. If we continue with the distribution of the entire social product, we must set up the budget for the social operational units, as already mentioned. That was FP plus CP plus LP equals services. 8 million plus 50 million plus 50 million equals 108 million working hours. According to this budget, public operational units need 58 million working hours to renew their means of production and raw materials. These are therefore deducted from the remaining 600 million, leaving 542 million working hours on products. These 542 million correspond to the individual consumption of all workers. The question now is, how much is that for each worker? To answer this question, we have to determine what part of the product each worker receives. This will solve the problem. All workers together work 650 million hours, 600 million in productive operational units and 50 million in public ones but there are only 542 million working hours left for consumption. So everyone gets only the 542 out of 650 equals 0.83 part. The figure obtained in this way, which indicates that part of the work the workers receive as labor money, we call in short the payout factor, although it would be better to speak of the factor of individual consumption. In our example, it is 0.83, which means that a worker who has worked 40 hours receives only 0.83 times 40 equals 33.2 33.2 working hours of compensation for consumption. This is the third time we will be dealing with the same subject. First, we gave the principal solution, then this solution in numbers, and now we will put it into a general form. So it is always exactly the same, but expressed differently. What is the general form of the payout factor? The problem is the distribution of L. We subtract it from FP plus CP so that L minus FP plus CP remains. 
The remainder is distributed over L plus LP working hours, indicating that there are hours available for everyone. L minus FP plus CP over L plus LP. If we now replace the letters of the formula for the sake of clarity with the concrete numbers for our example, and call the payoff factor factor individual consumption, FIC, then this is FIC equals 600 minus 58 over 600 plus 50 equals 542 over 650 equals 0.83. This very simple calculation is possible because all operational units keep accurate accounts of their consumption of means of production, raw materials, and living labor. The general social accounting, which registers the flow of products by simple transfer, has in a simple way all the data necessary to determine the payout factor or payment factor. They result from a simple summation in the Jiro office. In this process of production and distribution, nobody assigns anything to anyone. It is not a distribution by persons, but the factual production itself that does it. The relationship of the producers to the social product lies in the things themselves. This is then also the explanation of the secret that a state apparatus has no place in production. The whole business life stands on the very real ground because the producers and consumers can manage and administer the whole process themselves. And at the same time, there is no breeding ground for exploitation and oppression. It is only on this basis that the conditions are created for the state to die off and take its place in the Museum of Antiquities next to the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. Mic drop. Very good, Alan. That's really good reading. That was a, quite a lump. Okay, so we finally got to our formula. We've got to our formula for calculating the FIC. I won't, we won't go through all the stuff. But basically, it's a very, very simple formula, which basically tells you for every hour you work, how much of it are you actually getting for your private consumption? How much do you have to pay into the general coffers to pay for these social services that everybody uses, including yourself? So in here, this example he gives is 0.83. So for every hour I work, I get 0.83 of that hour, which works out as for a 40-hour week, 33.2 hours. It's a really, really ridiculously simple formula. Let's just read this, this paragraph as well, which I think is a very, very meaningful paragraph for the argument of the book. In this process of production and distribution, nobody assigns anything to anyone. It's not a distribution by persons, but the factual production itself does it. The relationship of the producers to the social product lies in the things themselves. This is then also the explanation of the secret that a state apparatus has no place in production. The whole business life stands on the very real ground because the producers and consumers can manage and administer the whole process themselves. And at the same time, there is no breeding ground for exploitation and oppression. It's only on this basis that the conditions are created for the state to die off and take its place in the Museum of Antiquities next to the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. Okay, so they're making this case that the actual costing, the, the use of a non-exploitative measure, the way that each individual operational unit in society, even if they all have different tasks, even if some of these tasks a maybe considered more important or more strategic or whatever, they still don't get an exploitative wage. And the process of them actually accounting for their inputs and their outputs allows for people to see the actual structure needed to pay for our public and services or whatever. And there's still the direct link between the labor time and the price on the product and that this allows this breakdown for this breakdown of say structures above society to control this operational this like decentralized operation and you know management of production so i think it's probably a little bit utopian here but i do think that it is let's what do they say here there is no breeding ground for exploitation and, and oppression uh, you know i think there's always going to be breeding ground uh, in a society for oppression but it's whether the structures of society are set up in such a way to kind of minimize it is what i would say what anybody have any counts on our final this belter of a formula anybody have anything to say about this section chris yeah i mean going off of uh, your topic earlier about sorry my my stupid uh, barn raising analogy you know i like the formula i like how it works out but would it not be simpler just to, instead of looking at these as 
deductions, just actually additions of extra work, because ultimately that's what it is, right? I, I think calling them deductions makes it seem kind of sneaky, like you're sneaking in a tax when really this is sort of should be thought of as voluntary labor meant to support, you know, the general social work. That's just, yeah, that's my comment there. Like, but I do think you run into problems of, uh, I think you run into problems of the uh, division of labor. Uh, how do you have a brain surgeon donate some time who normally works? Oh, most no, of the time? not to, I don't, I don't mean like they actually have to do, you know, go raise a barn or something, but you know, <laughs> you, <laughs> but it, it's assumed that, you know, uh, a portion of your time, isn't going to your own personal consumption. It's it's being dedicated or earmarked for um, the support of social work. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Or as it's it's just another way of looking at it. Like you could also, I mean, yeah, sure, you could say, um, yeah, you there are these deductions made. I, I just I just like looking at it as I don't like looking at it as deductions. I suppose. <laughs> no, I ag I agree. It's like a contribution or something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm down with that use of language. Yeah, no, I think language is important as well. <laughs> you know, it says something about the process. You know, you know, capitalism. People look at the, lots of people look at the tax and they hate the tax man. Like, boo! Like that's why, like, you know, right wing politicians can make so much hay about we can just reduce taxes. People have a have a distinct dislike of tax, but if if it's you know, if society puts it forward in a different manner, it, I think it could also feel very different. Anybody else? I think we'll call it a day there and we can come back and, and maybe section H next time. I'll say goodbye to you all. We'll see you next Sunday, the same same bat channel, same bat, bat time, same bat channel, bat time. Is that, I don't know. Is there a bat time? I don't think so. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Thank you.